Happy Sabbath. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. And as we open God's Word, let's just bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. They're showing a film in the sanctuary of the church. Mother and daughter were sitting together in the pew and the mother turned suddenly. The girl was missing. She was a very young girl. Mother was quite concerned. And so she began walking up and down the aisles of the church in the dark trying to find her little girl. Just then the film ended and the lights came on and there was the child right up, right next to the screen looking up and taking it all in. Mother was quite exasperated and embarrassed, and she grabbed the little girl by the hand and yanked her back toward the seat. The daughter, in turn, was a little bit aggravated. I don't see what you're so upset about, Mother. I was here all the time. You see, there was a little girl who was lost in church and didn't know it. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter and the 12th verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, our lesson today. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. It is possible, brethren and sisters, to be lost in church and not know it. It could happen to any worshiper in this congregation today. It did happen to Judas. We don't like associating ourselves with Judas. But the truth of the matter is that Judas was like us. As a matter of fact, Judas was like the very best of us. Would you turn with me now to the book of Acts? The book of Acts. In the first chapter of Acts, Peter is preaching. Acts chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Again, Peter speaking. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Notice that 17th verse. Judas was numbered with us. Judas was a church member. He had part of this ministry. He was not only a member of the church, Judas was in the ministry. A miracle working ministry. Did you know that Judas had the gift of divine healing? Did you know that Judas had been empowered by Christ to cast out devils? Judas was capable. The book Desire of Ages, page 294, says he was of commanding appearance, a man of keen discernment and executive ability. The disciples were anxious that Judas should become one of their number. Could you imagine? Many of these men, the disciples, were very common men. They were fishermen 
tax collectors. They come, came from a variety of backgrounds. Could you imagine their excitement that somebody with Judas's intellect and experience and gifts should become one of them? You know how we tend to make over gifted people or celebrities when they come into the church? That's the way the disciples felt about Judas becoming one of them. But there's a brighter side still. Not only was he capable, Judas was sincere. The book Desire of Ages, again, page 717. He, Judas, felt in his own person the evidence of Christ's power. He recognized the teaching of Christ as superior to all that he had ever heard. He loved the great teacher. Oh, come on now, preacher. I couldn't be like Judas because I love Jesus. The desire of ages says that Judas loved the great teacher and felt a desire to be changed in character and in life. Oh, no, a man of such tremendous ability and judgment and who loved Jesus and who wanted his character changed, such a man as that could be lost. Whatever went wrong with Judas, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I would like to suggest for us today three problems that spelled Judas's doom. Three problems that are still making people within the church lost. The first problem with Judas was that he believed that his way was better than Jesus' way. Judas wanted to change, but he did not want to surrender. It was not that Judas was such a bad man. It was that Judas was so convinced that he was a good man. Christianity is trusting Christ's way as better than your own. Judas perpetually trusted his way as being better than Christ's. Desire of Ages again, pages 7, 17, and 7, 18. Judas had marked out a line upon which he expected Christ to work. He, Judas, had planned that John the Baptist should be delivered from prison. But John was left to be beheaded. And Jesus, instead of asserting his royal right and avenging the death of John, retired with his disciples into a country place. Judas wanted more aggressive warfare. He thought that if G Jesus would not prevent the disciples from carrying out their schemes, the work would be more successful. He marked the increasing enmity of the Jewish leaders and saw their challenge unheeded when they demanded from Christ a sign from heaven. Judas's impulse was, just give them what they want. They want a sign. Give them a sign. You're capable. You could give them a sign from heaven, and then they would believe. But Jesus knew better. Judas had it all planned out in his mind how it was all going to happen. And he could not understand why Jesus did not follow his plan. Did you ever stop and think that in some ways it's hardest for a man or a woman of good judgment to be a Christian? A man or a woman of good judgment is used to being right. He or she is used to having his or her own way. People with poor judgment are used to having other people's ways, ideas, plans better than their own. And so when Christ comes along and says, I have a better plan for your life, the person of poor judgment is used to accepting that kind of correction. But the man with good judgment is used to having his own way. Now, Judas's plan was actually typical among the Jews of his days and even among his fellow disciples. He wanted to make Christ a temporal king. And he waited. And he waited. And finally, the moment came at the feeding of the 5,000. Just think, said Judas, 
not to go hungry again ever. Now, we're used to politicians promising a lot of things. And a lot of it, there's no way they can make happen. And a lot of it's, of course, just lies, just whatever they need to say to get elected. And so with the instincts of the expert politician, Judas began to move throughout the crowd to begin a movement to make Jesus king right then and there. The story is told in the book of John, if you'll turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. Follow along as I read John chapter 6, verses 10 to 14. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. But notice now the 15th verse. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. There he goes again. Jesus messed it all up. Just at the precise moment when Judas had things going Christ's way and the plan was working to perfection, Jesus disappeared. The crowd caught up with him later at Capernaum when Jesus again spoke to the people. That's John the 6th chapter and the 53rd verse. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Oh no, thought Judas, that sounds like cannibalism. Jesus was offering food for people's souls, and he knew the people wanted their stomachs filled. This was not what people wanted. Judas knew best. Now, brethren and sisters, this is a piece of theology that sometimes perhaps we all get mixed up to some extent. And that is that the promise of Jesus is not to give us everything we want. His promise is to give us everything we need. And if you have been somewhat disillusioned and disappointed in what Christ has done for you, it may be because your carnal heart wants some things that are simply not good for you. Jesus promises not to give you everything you want. His promise is to give you everything you need. Judas's way ran something like this. Judas had it all planned out how they were going to make Jesus king, and then he tried to get Christ's approval for his plan. And don't we sometimes try to make Christ's will fit our plans? We know best. We know what we want Christ to do in our lives. We want, we want to control where our life goes and then just ask Jesus to kind of go along with our plan. I want to choose my life partner and then I try to get Christ's approval. I choose my life's work, and then I try to show that it's all right with Jesus. I choose my lifestyle, what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to go, and then I'll go to almost any extreme under the sun to prove, to rationalize that it's all right with Jesus. 
The Judas prayer is a prayer largely for Christ's approval of what I want to do with my life. And when Christ does not send the answer that makes it possible for me to do what I want to do and for me to have my own way, I lose faith in Christ. I become disillusioned like Judas. We say, that Galilean has let me down. How many here have not sometimes in prayer beat upon the door of heaven until your fists were bloody and God never did let you have your way? How can you love a God like that? That's a Judas prayer. Most of our prayers are probably Judas prayers. Trying to make Christ will fit our plans. But the Christian way is altogether different. It's to try to make our plans fit God's will. The Christian way is the way of submission. Not that the Christian has lost all of his backbone, but rather the Christian reasons like this. I know that I am important to Christ. I know that he has a plan for my life. And I trust him more than I trust myself. I have a direction that I want to go, but if God is not leading me in that direction, then I know it's because he has a different direction, a better direction for me to take. That's the Christian prayer. But it was a prayer that Judas never learned to pray. Because Judas's first problem was in believing that his way, his plan was better than Christ's. And Judas, like us, never got over his disappointment of not getting his own way. And that leads us to Judas's second problem. Judas harbored resentment. Turn, if you will, now to John, the 12th chapter, still in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. For a full year, that resentment smoldered of not getting his own way, mostly under the surface. But here at Mary's anointing of Jesus' feet, it exploded into life. John, the 12th chapter, verses 3 to 6. John, chapter 12, verses 3 to 6. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. You know, that word bear doesn't mean to carry, to, like to bear a burden. It doesn't mean to carry. It means to pilfer. Judas helped himself to the money. You see, Judas cared about the poor. He cared about poor Judas. You know, sometimes we still tend to complain about giving. You know, all the money that the church keeps talking about to give for church budget or to support... And my church, the school, or for children's ministries, women's ministries, whatever it is, evangelism, all of that money we're continually reminded of is necessary to be given so we can maintain or refurbish God's house. Now, I believe we ought to be very cautious in the way we spend the Lord's money. It's holy money. But brethren and sisters, talking about money and worship is extremely necessary and extremely important. Why? Not just so we can pay the bills. But every time we talk about it, it is a private test to every worshiper. We can tell by our reaction whether our criticisms sometimes simply covers up a desire to spend our money on ourselves instead of sharing it with the Lord and for his work. You see, it was not that Judas didn't love Christ. It was just that he loved money more. 
Surely hardly any of us would say, I don't love Christ. But I wonder how many of us love money more. Now the smoldering resentment that stayed beneath the surface in the life of Judas finally came to the surface. Resentment will make its way out. If you carry around resentments, you can usually hide them quite well, especially in public, but they'll come out somewhere sometime. A minister back in the Midwest once told the following story. He said, when I first became a college teacher, we had been in evangelism for many years, so we didn't own a home, we had very little money, we were always traveling around the country doing evangelism. But finally, we were settling down for a longer period of time, and we wanted to take a place in the country. He said, we had $4,000, and at that time, it was terribly difficult to borrow any money for rural property. And so we finally found an old farmhouse on seven acres that we bought for $10,000. The house, as you can imagine, didn't amount to too much. He said, we had four children. Our three sons were grade school age, and together we worked to rebuild that old house. The place even provided its own lumber as there were a number of outbuildings, including a big old barn. We tore down most of that barn and used the lumber to build a wing on the house. When finally we got all the lumber that was usable, there was still a bit of the barn left, mainly the bottom part, you know, that had been kind of rotted out over the years. And so they were pretty tired at that point of tearing down structures, and so they decided they would burn the rest. He said, we got our hoses out, we were going to be safe, made sure it wasn't windy, and we started the fire, and we watched carefully until the fire burned down and went out. We went to bed. We got up the next morning, and sure enough, everything looked safe. There was just a little smoke here and there left over, but the barn was certainly gone. The fire had done its work. We all went off to school and to work. When we came home that evening, as we drove in, we were shocked. A great large area, the entire portion of the pasture around the barn had all turned black. The neighbor came running over. He said the wind came up during the day and that fire had been smoldering, smoldering in that humus around the barn for many years. Just the manure, the dry manure and all had built up around the barn and provided fuel for the fire. And so beneath that, the fire still burned, undetectable. How embarrassed we were, he said. We'd gone off and the place had caught fire. But then he said, I didn't feel quite so badly because lo and behold, the same fire department that had to come and put out that fire had to come out the next day to put out the fire again because they didn't get it all because it was smoldering, almost hidden beneath the surface. It wasn't difficult to eradicate the part of the fire that showed, but there was something beneath still burning. And eventually, when the wind would begin to blow, the fire would come up. And there may be some in this congregation today that has that kind of a fire burning some aggravation, some hatred, some lack of forgiveness, some resentment, and it's burning down so low that people don't even see it. But then a wind comes up, and all of a sudden it flares into life. Do you realize that if Judas had died one week earlier, he would have died as one of the most respected of Christians? Judas's record was a good record except for the last week of his life because that resentment had been kept beneath the surface. Dear brother, dear sister, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry if somebody has treated you badly, and especially if that has happened in the church. But remember, nobody can make you resentful but yourself. 
Resentment is caused not by how we are treated, but by how we react to the way we're treated. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And the third thing that got Judas lost was simply the fact that he waited too long. Matthew, if you'll turn with me to Matthew, our last text today, Matthew, the 27th chapter. Matthew, the 27th chapter, beginning with the third verse. Let's look at verses 3 through 5. Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. I have betrayed innocent blood. Do you realize that the only voice ever raised to defend the innocence of Jesus was the voice of Judas? I have betrayed innocent blood. It also says that he repented himself. Now, the word in the original Greek means to be sorry afterward, to regret, to be seized with remorse. He was only sorry afterward. He was sorry only for the after results. Brethren and sisters, the person who waits to follow Christ's plan until after he understands it is invariably too late to fit Christ's plan. In fact, he's not even following Christ's plan at all. He's following his own judgment. Like Judas, perhaps many of us here could be lost while planning to be saved. I'm going to be an overcomer later. I'm going to put Christ first later. I'm going to forgive and overcome my resentment later. Dear friend, the only time we have is now. You stand at the water's edge with one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat, and the boat is pulling out. You have a decision to make. It's got to be all dock, or it's got to be all boat, or it's going to be all wet. And those of us who stand to straddle with one foot within the program of Christ and one in the church, I, excuse me, and one in the world, I plead with you today, now is the time to get all the way in with Jesus. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Judas should have been one of the most doubts standing of all the disciples, but he died of suicide. First of all, because he thought that his way was better than Christ's. Secondly, because he allowed resentment to build up within his soul. And finally, because he waited to repent until it was too late. There were two men who hung on two trees that fateful Friday. Judas's tree was a lifeless tree, a life-taking tree, a hangman's tree. Beneath the tree of Judas, we see the motto expressed by Judas's words as he bargained with the chief priest, What will ye give me? But there was another tree. Christ's tree was a life-giving tree, the cross of Calvary. And beneath that tree, we see the motto from Gethsemane, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
Two trees, two mottos. What a contrast. What will ye give me? Lord, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You will spend this week beneath one of those trees. Which tree is your tree? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. My challenge today is for you to be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. Amen.